Father, for the privilege of uh, being able to worship you freely. We pray, Father, that we may continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we give you thanks and praise for the availability of your word and for the ministering of your Holy Spirit. So we just pray, Father, that uh, we may be still before you as we open the scriptures, as our brother Peter prayed, that we may have understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our message is entitled, Where is Your Treasure? It is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through to 24. And uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, you may turn with me. Or maybe it's over uh, in the overhead. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The passage that we just read causes us to stop and evaluate just where our heart is. It is true that we live in a world where many things vie for our attention. Now in Matthew 6, one of the temptations is doing good works before men in order to receive their praise. The Lord says, if we seek man's praise, we have our reward. We forfeit our eternal reward. We are encouraged rather to seek to glorify God and do good in secret and, uh, ob and be openly rewarded by our Heavenly Father. The Lord pointed out charitable works, prayer and fasting as examples. The religious leaders of Jesus' uh, day wanted to be elevated in society and be seen as very religious. Their religion was for showmanship. The second temptation uh, we are confronted with is seeking to store uh, the treasures of this world. And many have come short and have succumbed to worldliness. Some are never satisfied. They just want more and more. More money, more possessions, greater comfort, and a life of ease. So for our first point, we shall be looking at examples of people who had a wrong focus in this regard. In Joshua 7, 21, we see how Achan coveted a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. He disobeyed God and caused his own death the death of his entire family, and the loss of all his livestock. God had instructed the sons of Israel uh, not to take any of the forbidden things and to bring the gold and silver into God's treasury. Therefore, uh, by keeping the forbidden things, Achan stole from God. We are also reminded of uh, Ananias and uh, Sapphira, how they wanted the praise of men and lied to the Holy Spirit. They desired to be looked upon as committed Christians who had sold everything for God's glory. However, they kept back 
part of the money for themselves. Theirs was a half-hearted giving. Both of them lost their lives. They made the wrong choice and they forfeited their reward in heaven. And then we have the rich young man of Matthew 19, uh, 18, 21, 23 to 24, who approached the Lord Jesus with a burning question. He wanted to know what he had to do to have eternal life. And the Lord replied, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. The Lord answered, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man was pleased with himself, said, all these things I have kept, what do I still lack? And the Lord replied, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. The rich young man had his heart in the wrong place. He had the wrong focus. He could not make that sacrifice. It was hard for him to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow the Lord Jesus. You see, the Word of God says, if we cannot love those whom we can see, we cannot claim to love God whom we have never seen. And then the Lord went on to say, how hard it is for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So we have seen uh, a few examples of people who had their hearts in the wrong place, people who laid up their treasures on earth, and the results of all these was death. Their hearts were set upon worldly possessions. They were willing to disobey God for temporal riches. The earthly possessions that we gather in this life are only temporal. They are passing away. They have no eternal value. The question is, where is our treasure? Are we investing in that which is eternal? Or are we concerned only with the temporal? For our second point, we would look at uh, examples of people who had the right focus. I am reminded of George Muller, who trusted God and discovered great opportunities to help thousands of people throughout his lifetime. In his autobiography, we read of his inspiring journey from his life of sin and rebellion to conversion to Christianity. He shares his struggles and triumphs as he establishes orphan homes to care for thousands of children. He had an unwavering dependence upon his heavenly father. He was born in uh, Kruppenstedt in Germany in 1805, and he died in 1898. He was an evangelist. At age 70, he traveled around the world preaching the gospel in many countries. He was able to speak in several different languages, so he was able to communicate effectively. He continued his missionary work until the age of 90. According to him, during the 17 years of evangelistic work, he reached out to millions of people. And all his expenses were covered through answer to prayer. In 1834, Mr. Muller started the Scripture Knowledge Institution for Home and Abroad. Its purpose was to help Christian day schools, to assist missionaries, and 
to distribute the scriptures. The institution was established without sponsorship from anyone, but through faith in the Lord Jesus. And during his lifetime, the institution received and distributed uh, no less than one and a half million pounds. The biggest portion was spent on orphanages. At the time of his death, over a hundred thousand people had been taught in the schools that were supported by these funds. Over 280,000 Bibles, one and a half million New Testaments had been distributed. Millions of religious books, pamphlets, and tracts had been circulated. Missionaries had been helped in many parts of the world. And 10,000 orphans had been cared for. George Muller, as a result of his relationship with God, was willing to put God's interests above his own. He totally depended upon the Lord Jesus. Therefore, God used him as a channel of blessing to millions of people. He invested his time, his energy, and his knowledge for kingdom purposes. Another example of someone who had the right focus in life was Robert Lee Tunnell. He was an outstanding Christian inventor and a successful businessman. From a sixth grade dropout, he went to become the leading earth-moving manufacturer of his time. He had plans uh, on four continents. He was a major contributor to road construction and heavy equipment that changed the world. In the early 1900s, roads were built by employing uh, large uh, numbers of men with shovels and the use of mules to uh, drag small plows. He was among the first road construction contractors to introduce uh, machinery to moving earth. It was in 1919 that as a Christian, he felt the need to do more for God. He thought that anyone who was fully committed to Christ had to become either a pastor or a missionary in order to fulfill the Great Commission. He went uh, to his pastor for advice. And after much prayer with his pastor, he was surprised to learn that God needs businessmen also. This was new to him. And from then on, he began to consider his business to be in partnership with God. The end of the 1920s marked the start of the Great Depression in American history. This was not the time for anyone to be in debt. It was a time somewhat like the pandemic that the world is experiencing now. This COVID-19 period will, uh, that we are experiencing shall result in closure of many businesses, job losses, and much hardship. At the age of 40, in 1927, Le Tourneau was in debt to the tune of $100,000. As with many businesses, there are uh, lean times and times of plenty. But Le Tourneau trusted God. Since God was his partner, he handed the problem to God to solve. And he was amazed to see how God restored his business. He commented that God uses the weak to confound the, the mighty. It was his attorney that advised him to solve his financial woes by selling his earth-moving equipment. So he focused all his energies on the manufacturing business rather than his road construction business. He manufactured earth-moving equipment he had tremendous sales. 
when the country was reeling under the effects of the Great Depression, his business was thriving. And in 1935, at the suggestion of his wife, Evelyn, they agreed to give 90% of their earnings to the Lord Jesus. 10% of the income was theirs to use. And with the money, they established the Laetano Foundation to administer the funds. Millions of dollars were donated to religious organizations and towards education. Robert was a man after God's own heart. He determined to invest his treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, it does not matter what our station in life is. God needs us all. Whether we be lawyers, doctors, scientists, bookkeepers, accountants, secretaries, pilots, train drivers, professors, caregivers, cashiers, God wants all to be devoted to in kingdom work. God wants all those who have a relationship with him to focus on storing their treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our third point, we're going to look at ways of storing treasure. Now, storing treasures in heaven is not just about giving of our tithes and offerings. Yes, it is good when we freely give of our tithes to God. It is God's expectation for us to give as he has blessed us. We give so that there may be food in his house. We give to advance his kingdom. But that is not all that is involved in storing our treasures in heaven. Storing our treasures in heaven is living our lives for God's glory and for the good of our fellow men. But how do we store these treasures? By living in the way that God wants us to live and following the Lord Jesus in all that we do and by loving our neighbor as ourselves. This love for our neighbors is proof that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus. If someone is in great need, we rally around that person and give help as we are able. When we give to others, we must give freely and with a cheerful heart. We honor God in our relationships. We can treat others as we would like to be treated. We honor God by offering ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable and pleasing to, to Him. We store our treasures in heaven by sharing the good news with those around us. We can tell them our story and how much God loves them. We can let them know that God desires to have a relationship with them. This is the greatest thing that could ever happen to anyone, to become a child of God and be free from sin and death. We are encouraged in Luke 14, verses uh, 13 to 14, to give to others who cannot repay us. It is written, But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. We can store our treasures in heaven by enduring persecution for the gospel's sake. It is written in Matthew 5, 11 to 12, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For 
in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you who were before you. We can also store our treasures by enduring suffering for Christ. In Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, it is written, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and monetary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And in Matthew 25, 35 to 36, Jesus promises rewards for those who feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, take care of the sick, and visit prisoners. These are all ways that we can invest our treasures in heaven. The Lord says, will say to them, Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For our fourth point, we're going to look at what is our greatest treasure. The greatest treasure we could ever have is our relationship with the Lord Jesus. We should value and guard jealously this relationship, never allowing anything or anyone to interfere or distract us from him. The Lord Jesus is to have first place in our hearts and in our lives. It is good for us to be like the Apostle Paul who said, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the supper passing greatness of knowing Christ, my Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. He is, if he is our central focus, it will not be difficult to store our treasures in heaven because our love for him will be the motivating factor. Another question is, how do we demonstrate a never-ending love for the Lord Jesus? By making ourselves available to serve Him and by serving our fellow men. It is true that none of us has, uh, has seen God, but we can prove our love for Him by loving others as we love ourselves. Yes, we can give ourselves away for others. This takes commitment. We have to be prepared to let the Lord have his way. Not our will, but the will of Christ must prevail. We know what God's will is for us. We are to love him with our whole heart, our whole mind, body and soul and all our strength. If we love anything else or anyone else more than we love God, we are guilty of idolatry. The Lord says in uh, Matthew 10, 37 to 13, uh, 39, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. 
And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. We belong to God because he paid the price for our sin. We have been redeemed not by silver or gold, but by his precious blood. Therefore, he is absolutely worthy of all of our love. For our fourth, fifth point, good vision. The Lord continued in Matthew 6, to 23. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Speaking of the eye, William Barclay states that the eye is regarded as the window through which the light gets into the whole body. The color and state of a window determine what light gets into a room. He says, if the window is clear, clean and undistorted, the light will flood into the room and will light every corner of it. But if the glass of the window is colored or frosted, uh, dirty or obscure, the light will be hindered and the room will not be lit up. So, if riches are the focus of our lives instead of our love for the Lord Jesus, our vision is going to be distorted. What we value, uh, when we value what we can see more than the eternal that is unseen, as somebody says, we have spiritual nearsightedness. The eye is the gateway through which light enters the body. And if the eyes are good, the whole body will be full of light. How would we describe our vision? Do we see through the eye of faith? Are we able to see spiritual truths in their proper perspective? Do we have a clear vision of the Lord Jesus and a clear understanding of his will for us? You see, it is easy to lose our focus. It is easy to get sidetracked by worldliness. So we must be aware of being worldly-minded. There are two types of eyes that men can have, either good or bad. The person with a bad eye distorts the truth of God's word. He calls that which is good, bad, and that which is evil, good. He is driven by ungodliness. He deliberately chooses not to see or to know God. He does not pursue or, uh, righteousness, but chooses to have his own way. But God is not willing for any to perish. That is why he sent his son to die for the sin of this world. He does not delight in the death of a sinner. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it is written, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is patiently waiting for that person to repent. He wants that person to have a change of heart and a change of mind. For our sixth point, God's desire. It is necessary for one to be a citizen of heaven in order to invest in the kingdom of heaven. There are no foreign investors in heaven. Only those who have repented and trusted the Lord Jesus and remain true to him Seek him daily, live lives that are acceptable and pleasing to him, can store their treasures in heaven. They are the ones who have their names written in the book of life, Luke 10 verse 20. To accept Christ is to have treasure in heaven. 
There may be some who are watching this live stream that do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to turn to the Lord Jesus. The Word of God says that to know the Father and the Son is to have eternal life. It is written, Behold, today is the day of salvation. No one was promised tomorrow. Do not resist the urging of the Holy Spirit. You do well to repent if you want eternal life. For it is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus that anyone can be saved. Therefore, turn to the Lord while there is time. Accept the gift, free gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Having a relationship with God because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. It is true that nobody wants to die. Most of us want to live forever. There is good news for all. Those who believe that Jesus is Lord and that he died for the sin of the world and rose again on the third day have life. Even though they die, yet shall they live. Therefore, call on the Lord Jesus today, and you will be saved. Become a new creation, and make your life count for the Lord Jesus. Then you also can begin to invest wisely into his kingdom. You also can store your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy, and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Where's your heart? On the other hand, the man with the good eye is the person who has been made pure by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that is being directed by the Holy Spirit along the paths of righteousness. He spends his energy laying up treasures in heaven. He is a person that prays and fasts, not to be seen uh, by men like the hypocrites, but in secret before God. The Lord says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, and love the other. Or else, he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Lord Jesus did not say that money is bad. But it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. In 1 Timothy 6.10, it is written, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have swayed from the faith in their greediness, and they pierce themselves with many sorrows. God Almighty does not want us to trust in the riches of this world, but to trust in Him, for He is the only true and living God. And when we trust Him, he gives us all things to enjoy. He supplies all our needs and gives us enough to bless others. We were called in Christ Jesus for good works. And what is more, he wants our good works to remain. These good works translate into eternal rewards. How great it would be if all of us could hear the Lord say on that day, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, 
we just pray that you may align our will with your will. That, Father, you may have your way with us and just show us how we can truly store treasures in heaven, especially during this COVID period. Help us, Father, to be able to navigate ways and means to witness for our Lord Jesus Christ and to store treasures in heaven. We thank you, Father, for having so loved us in that whilst we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us. Thank you for the gift of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.